<sighs> Do I have a riff? Do I have a riff for the beginning here? There's so much background noise right now, and I haven't been able to cut my hair in like two months. Do you like Star Trek? Or have you at least seen it, even if you think it's ridiculous? Well, as long as you're not the third weird category who hasn't seen Star Trek at all, then you'll probably recognize the phrase, bypass the EPS relays. The relays will reject the overload, Mr. Spock. Then bypass the relays, go to manual control. There's a way to bypass the relays. It looks like the doctors rerouted the power relays. Do you know anything about bypassing a power relay? Relay failures bypassed. You'll be a lot happier if we can bypass the EPS relays. I've been hearing jokes about this phrase for most of my life. It's one of those meaningless pieces of techno babble the show could just as easily do without, if you ask some people. But what if I told you that it's maybe, actually, one of the most solid connections to the realities of war in the entire franchise, and that this right here is the kind of relay that they're talking about? Or at least, I think it is. The car battery sized thing on the table before us is very different from my usual bread and butter. It's a chunk of unsophisticated high power electrical switch gear whose size would normally be the most interesting thing about it. Uh, this was probably a cost no object design uh, in addition to being intrinsically very simple. So I have little to no commentary on how it was designed or made. I would guess the answer to both is pretty well, but it's really beyond my ability to judge. What makes this interesting for our purposes is that, if I'm not mistaken, it came out of a U.S. Navy vessel, possibly a battleship or something like that. Now, I am not a fan of the American military or any military, to put it mildly, and I don't generally like showing off things that only exist for violent purposes. This is that, and it's also maybe broken and certainly impossible for me to demonstrate, and for all those reasons, I almost left it at the junk store. It's just a simple electrical component. I didn't think it was something I could make a video about at all. Being military surplus didn't change that math at first, but then I read the label on this handle and I got intrigued. <clears throat> Push only, battle override. That's chilling and it should be. I can't find any documentation on this device, not online at least. Can't find any proof it exists, actually. It's a kind of a Google whack if I look it up. Uh, but for the most part, it seems that's because it's an ordinary electrical component. It's uh, almost what some people call a jelly bean, a generic part. Uh, you don't actually need an in-depth description of what it does because the labels on the sides with the specifications tell you everything that any electrical engineer would need to know. So for instance, the part number is B-408, and next to that number it says contactor or relay. That is what this appears to be. Now a relay is a very common everyday component. It lets you use a small amount of power to turn a much larger amount of power on and off. In other words, it's a switch you can flip remotely. A contactor is a slightly different type of relay. The distinction doesn't matter enough to get into. I think this actually is a contactor, but I'm gonna call it a relay for artistic purposes. They're pretty much the same thing anyway. It is pretty sizable as relays go. Um, again, from the specs, it can switch up to 350 amps at 450 volts. That's about 150 kilowatts if I did my math right. So yeah, it's pretty big. It's also rated for uh, 400 hertz power, uh, which is actually typically used in aviation and apparently sometimes naval vessels. I don't actually know where this was used. I'm just guessing it was a ship because of the color scheme. This is a three-pole relay, a uh, single throw, which is like saying that it contains three separate switches that all actuate at once and that they only turn on and off. They don't have other positions than on and off. Uh, the coil voltage, that is what you apply to the electromagnet inside that pulls the contacts together, is 28 volts DC. And this relay is normally open, which means the contacts aren't connected until you apply power. The contacts go through these connections back here. You've got switch one, two, and three. Now, if I were to apply power to the right pair of wires coming out of this plug here, if I knew which ones they were, you would hear a loud clunk as this thing engaged. Then A1 would connect to A2, B1 to B2, and C1 to C2. And I would love to demonstrate that for you, but this isn't adequately labeled as to where the current goes. And I'm not interested in starting a fire if I get something wrong. Um, this is, after all, from 1974, if the label is to be believed. 
And also it might have been thrown out for a reason. So I'm not going to mess with it. It would just go clunk. There's not much to see. Now it has a continuous duty cycle rating, which I believe means that you can apply voltage to the coil at eight in the morning and leave this running until eight the next day with no problem. This is in contrast to a partial duty cycle, which would mean you could trigger it for say a few minutes, but you then need to turn it off and let it cool for a couple more minutes before you could trigger it again. And that's that. Those are all the specs I have and they're really all I need. Like I said, relays are not complex or special, and this is not the largest or specialist one by a long shot. Nothing particularly remarkable about it, except the thing on top that appears to be a huge plunger that says battle override. Now, this doesn't move, but I think that's because battle override is currently engaged already. But what does it mean to engage battle override? Well, like I said already, I have no documentation, no proof this was used on a ship or a plane or what type thereof or whether it ever saw use at all. So this entire narrative is going to be speculation. The specifics are probably incorrect, but thematically, I think I have it right. And what we can be sure of is that this was meant to be carried into battle as part of a war machine of some kind. And like I said, I don't like talking about war machines, things used to kill people or to help with the process. But since we're already here, let's remember that those machines and their crews also become targets themselves. And this plunger is a reminder of that. If you have a reason to use this, it means someone is trying to kill you, justified or not. Naturally, military equipment is designed with that expectation in mind. And apparently the override feature is a response to it. It's something you'll find all throughout military vehicles in devices called battle shorts. And I don't mean a pair of these. See, warplanes, tanks, battleships, these are all machines. They're dozens or thousands of tons of steel and aluminum made animate, sometimes by hydraulic power, but often by electricity. There are a lot of electrical components in a battleship, uh, for instance. You've got you know, motors, you've got lights, uh, you've got heaters, you've got radar equipment. Let's focus on motors, since they're simple and easy to think about. Now, the nature of electric motors is that they turn electricity into torque, but also into some amount of heat. And the more resistance they meet when they try to turn, the more power they'll turn into heat. And the nature of machines in general is that the parts are not self-aware. A motor asked to drive an immovable object like a jammed door won't notice that it's struggling. It'll just try and try until it overheats, melts its insulation, melts its windings, and probably starts a fire, destroying itself and endangering everything around it. We can't rely on humans to watch every part of every machine at every moment, so we build into them automatic protections. They aren't born with instincts for self-preservation. We have to add them. Fuses, fusible links, breakers, computerized current meters, and thermal sensors are all directly or indirectly ways to measure how hot a device is getting. Some of them actually measure electrical current, but you can calculate heat output from amperage if you know the characteristics of the device in question. So we discover those characteristics. We put motors under realistic and unrealistic loads to find out how much current they can pull before they get too hot. And then we put devices in place to limit how much current they can draw. With those devices in place, motors will effectively give up before they can hurt themselves or others. And virtually all motors, except in the simplest devices, are protected in some way. If you block the drawer on a CD-ROM, the drive will notice that something's wrong, give up, and pull the drawer back in before it can damage the gears. And of course, that's the most minor example possible. The degree of protection increases along with the stakes. Um, a power drill, for instance, contains enough juice in this battery to start a fire. No problem. So everyone has a thermal fuse tucked inside the motor. That's a component that breaks the circuit if it gets too hot. This skips right over the current measuring and goes straight to the question of heat. If the motor's too hot, the fuse blows, the device quits working, and the heat dissipates. It's as simple as that. But modern devices are more sophisticated and they usually try to split the difference. Uh, this Ryobi, for instance, is pretty cheap. Uh, it still has a fair amount of torque, but I can still stall it with my hand. And if you do, it'll struggle for a moment and then give up. But if I let go, pull the trigger again, it springs right back to action. The microcontroller inside this drill noticed the motor was stalled and it shut off the power to protect itself until I let go of the trigger again. So this has saved me from having to replace this device. That's convenient, saved me a hundred bucks. 
There's still a thermal fuse in here, but it's only a backup in case the monitoring circuitry fails. And as costs go up, I imagine the protections usually become more sophisticated. I would guess that a $200,000 earth mover has a couple layers of fail safes, so the motors have plenty of opportunities to be shut down safely before you blow a fusible link or a motor winding, either of which will cause significant downtime and possibly require a $5,000 repair. So these protections can save you a lot of inconvenience. Now, military vehicles have all the same concerns, but convenience is the least of their worries. Uh, an automated door or a ramp, um, a gun turret, an ammo elevator could all get jammed for any number of reasons. Maybe a, a maintenance error, someone didn't regrease something, maybe someone left a retaining pin in place, or maybe the machine suffered damage in combat, imagine that. Any machine can get stuck, but if that machine weighs 50 tons and the motor that moves it draws 200 amps, a failure could be lethal. Running a motor like that with the shaft stalled could probably start a really big fire really fast, and that could be more deadly than an actual enemy attack. Fires at sea in particular are incredibly dangerous, largely because there's nowhere to escape, but even worse, an electrical fire can happen during peacetime. Imagine the sheer tragedy of a training exercise ending with all hands lost because someone forgot to pull out a safety pin. The sort of thing happens. Imagine having to tell someone's mother that they died on American soil shuttling tanks around in the motor pool because they bumped into a tree and didn't realize it till they tried to force the turret to move. Two or 300 amps is a scary amount of power, but some equipment just can't operate without that kind of juice. So naturally, they're going to be full of fail safes, like this. A relay isn't intrinsically a protective device, but it can be used as part of a protective system. Presumably, this gated the power to a large piece of equipment, a traverse motor on a ship's turret, let's say. Uh, you'd put three phase power into it, one, two, three phases, and it would just go straight through to the turret, which would then have its own actual control circuitry. This wouldn't be what actually makes it turn. Uh, this would be what energizes the entire piece of equipment. So this relay is normally open, and that means when the ship is first being started up, all the systems are unpowered. Once the engines come up to speed and they have power, they stay unpowered until someone goes around and turns them on. Uh, this would be a fail-safe design. Basically, uh, if someone left the wires outside this turret crossed when they were doing maintenance, then starting the ship up wouldn't cause a fire to start in an area where nobody actually is at that moment. Everybody goes around, checks their various departments, and once they say everything looks good, then they start turning on systems one at a time. At least that's how I would do it. A safe system by default doesn't work until you tell it to work rather than vice versa. That's why the normally open contacts. So you start up the ship, you hit all these buttons, this relay goes clunk, and now the turret is energized. Now the wiring that feeds into this relay is being monitored somewhere else. There's some system with a current loop that's measuring the amperage going into this machine. And if it sees too much, it cuts the power to the coil, drops the contacts, and the turret goes dead before anything bad can happen. Now, there are far more wires coming out of this plug than are necessary for just a coil, and the diagram on the side shows that there's a whole bunch of contacts down here separate from the main three that make up the contactor. So I would guess these are for monitoring. You'd have uh, loops that go to various control centers around the ship, and when this relay trips, um, a bunch of lights all over the place go dark and maybe some alarms start going off, and that triggers somebody to go find out what's wrong, send down repair crews, and then once they fix the problem, they hit the reset button, the system checks whether there's still a fault, and if not, it turns the relay back on, and the turret can be used again. I just made all of that up, but I think it makes sense. I, I don't see what else you would do with this. Uh, and it would explain why it has a battle short feature. But of course, we have to explain what the heck a battle short is now. See, there's a flip side of all these overcurrent protection systems. The breakers, the fuses, yes, they avoid fires. They prevent machinery from self-destructing, but the cost is that they, you know, make the machinery stop working. And that can really be a problem during a war. Let's look at this 1987 publication from the very awkwardly named Association of Scientists and Engineers of the Naval Sea Systems Command. I have no idea how that acronym would work. Uh, and they summarize the idea in typically military lingo. Battle short is based on the precepts that routine maintenance is not required during combat, that systems degradation is preferable to systems shutdown, and that systems can and will operate in combat under less than ideal conditions. That's a, 
That's a very typically dry way to put it. It really dilutes what they're saying so heavily that you'd almost never realize what it really means. So to translate a bit, electrical equipment should preferably be used under specific conditions for maximum safety and reliability. Not too much current, not too much heat, not knee deep in water, properly ventilated, hydrated, in their lane, etc. But ideal conditions aren't always possible during war. Things get shorted out, stuck, overheated, flooded, cooling fans fail. And during peacetime, you want equipment to shut down in those conditions, but during battle, you don't. And in fact, you often don't really need to. In real world terms, yes, electric motors do get very hot when you over torque them but they don't blow up right away. They can take a lot of punishment before any serious damage is done. Suppose that this motor was designed for 20 amps of continuous duty. It really isn't, but imagine it was. If you stall this motor, if you hold it still, it might be pulling 40 amps. That's too much. It, it'll destroy the windings, eventually. Maybe it'll take 20 seconds of stalling at full power, or maybe longer, maybe a minute or two. An instantaneous burst of current may create a lot of heat, but the motor may be able to survive that briefly. And in fact, most motors do experience enormous overcurrent on the regular. Whenever they're starting from a dead stop, it's not a problem as long as it's only for a moment. Now, engineers account for this. Um, fuses and breakers are chosen for some percentage more than the rated current of the motor and they're often designed to trip or blow only if the overcurrent persists for a few seconds. That provides headroom for startup torque or momentary unexpected resistance, but they'll still cut out if something is genuinely jammed. That's the safe approach, and it's usually what you want, but even a decent safety margin doesn't cover all exceptions. If someone, say, doesn't grease the track on a motorized door, the increase in friction might push the motor hard enough to trip a breaker. That sucks. It forces someone to go find out what happened, manually retract the door, re-lubricate it, reset the breaker, and try again. It's irritating, but it's the cost of safety. The technician called down to deal with this knows this was a safety decision. But in the back of their mind, there's that question. Would pushing it actually have hurt the motor? Because maybe that dry patch in the track is only an inch long. Maybe it only needed to exert those 40 amps for three seconds, and then it would have been past the obstruction, no harm done, and nobody would have to go take the door apart. If you're that person, you might wish that those protections were a little more forgiving, that they would allow a bit more excess power once in a while, just so you can get through your day and deal with the maintenance later. Well, too bad for you. Engineers have to be conservative. They have to get maximum safety and lifetime out of things at the cost of the occasional inconvenience. But, of course, it's far worse than inconvenient for a breaker to trip while you're being shot at. As the crew of a tank or a ship, you don't necessarily care if your vehicle survives, or if it needs to be repaired later, or even gets totally destroyed, nearly so much as whether you survive. War is a time of many exceptions. Exceptions to maintenance schedules, to safety precautions, and to safety in general. Tanks and ships get shot at, things get broken and jammed by shrapnel and collisions. They have to operate in non-ideal conditions, but like the crew, the machines don't have the luxury of shutting off to protect themselves. They need to work until they physically can't anymore. For example, uh, military aircraft. Uh, in past decades, particularly during World War II, I don't think they do this anymore, warplanes had a capability called war emergency power. Their engines had a certain maximum safe horsepower rating, but they could produce much more. In fact, most engines can do this, but at the cost of massively increased internal wear and tear. The sudden stress of a huge increase in fuel and air supply can cause an engine to fail prematurely or even immediately. If you just give a motor all the gas it can physically take, it can literally explode. And in a plane, that sends you plummeting to your death. So engineers pick a safe maximum position for the throttle that gets the most output for the least amount of wear. However, if the pilot really needed to get out of the situation, well, wear and tear is hardly relevant compared to getting shot at, so those engines could be deliberately pushed outside of their safe operating range, sometimes by a wide margin. But it would impose so much wear that the plane would need a total engine rebuild or even replacement once it was on the ground, assuming you made it to the ground. Under normal circumstances, this would be an inexcusable risk, but if you're being shot at, almost any risk is automatically a better choice. The pilot needed the option to breach the barrier between safe, regular operation and step forth into unsafe, exceptional operation, trading a great risk against the danger they already faced. 
And that decision had to be spelled out and unmistakable. The P-51, for instance, could produce an extra thousand horsepower if the situation called for it, but you couldn't just slam the throttle forward. You had to break a wire and lift a lever to allow the throttle to move that far. It couldn't be done by accident or casually. The pilot had to decide consciously that the extra risk was justified and choose to leave safety behind. This option to leave safety behind in service of the moment is apparently now available on lots of military equipment. Uh, consider if you're in a tank and there's shrapnel stuck in the turret bearings, they won't move as smoothly as they should, but they might still be able to move. It might strain the motors. Maybe they have to run at twice their rated current to overcome that extra friction. Maybe it'll burn half the insulation off the windings. Maybe you'll only get one more shot off before your turret's dead for good, but that's not your immediate concern. In that moment, you don't care what happens to your tank. You don't even care if you do start a fire. That's a problem for future you. Two minutes from now, you could worry about the fire. The shells flying at you right now are what matter most, and the ability to move and return fire is top priority no matter the cost but that's just too much nuance for breakers and fuses and even computers to understand. Only the human operator can do that math, and battle shorts make it possible. The idea is simple. If you know you're about to go into battle, you take a lap around your vehicle and you shut off all those protections. You use bus bars or switches to bypass fuses and breakers to take them completely out of every circuit so you just have solid copper between your power supply and your machinery. And that way, there's no possibility of a breaker tripping at the worst possible moment or having to replace a fuse while you're under fire. Your vehicle will just keep fighting until it literally burns itself out. This, of course, puts the safety of your tank or ship into your hands. I imagine it becomes the responsibility of the crew to think about their decisions a little more. How much current is being used and where, and whether it's justified or if they should let up a little, because the vehicle won't protect them even from themselves anymore. It sounds like a nightmare situation to me, I don't know what the military doctrine is on this. I mean, do they even teach people to ask these questions or are things too chaotic to even think about it? I mean, humans can only handle so much mental workload after all, and the middle of combat is probably a bad time to be thinking like, uh, how long have I been pulling on this lever? Um, 500 watts times 10 seconds. It's probably not very safe to rely on human judgment in that way when we're talking about immense amounts of power in an enclosed space, but war isn't a very safe activity. And uh, that's pretty much it. That's, that's all there is to it. That's what I learned about when I went looking to find out what this thing might be. Battle shorts are a very simple concept, and they're terrifying to think about, <laughs> because as I understand it, uh, you turn these on before you go into a fight. And that means that engaging a battle short is the act of predicting your own desperation. Like, you might be fine right now, but you are guessing that very soon you will be in mortal danger and struggling to stay alive. Maybe this is why I've never heard of these before. You know, it's not exactly part of the typical picture of military heroics. You know, damaged, barely functioning tanks burning out their own components in exchange for one last desperate attempt to get a shot off. But that is apparently part of the reality. And somehow, I think it made its way into the fiction as well. I mean, reading anything into Star Trek's techno babble is a fool's errand. The people who write the scripts literally just write the character interactions and then put the word tech on the page wherever they need, you know, tech. Uh, it gets filled in by co-writers later with whatever sounds good. And for the most part, there's not a whole lot of consistency. Um, they just keep some co stock concepts and phrases around and sprinkle them in wherever it sounds good. But all the same, this particular phrase, bypass the relays, does seem to get used pretty consistently in the same kind of scenarios. And I have to imagine that early on in the history of the franchise, some science consultant must have written it down with this idea in mind. I can't picture any other explanation. It had to come from somewhere. So if you'll play with me in this space for a moment. If the Enterprise is firing its phasers too long and hard, especially during a fight when they've taken damage, it stands to reason that these switching devices, the relays, might shut off when they see too much current for too long. So bypassing them might be a good way to prepare before a fight that's expected to use all the power they have available so the phasers don't cut out at a bad moment. Or maybe battle damage interferes with the relay controls, or too much sustained current burns out the contacts, so they can't be turned on anymore, but the power they were controlling is still available in the underlying plasma conduits. So if you bypass those failed or tripped relays, you can drive the weapons again, just without any safety precautions in place. Maybe something catches fire, maybe some consoles explode, but that beats the whole ship getting destroyed. 
And this is remarkable to me because despite the show never explaining it in those terms, it seems incontrovertible that this is what they mean. And moreover, I suspect that it is exactly how this specific battle short was used. I don't think this device was engaged before battle. See, the plunger says push only. So once you push it, something has to happen to unpush it, right? That suggests that this is not something that you would engage and disengage deliberately. This is a one-way thing to be used in a specific situation, and I think I know what it is. Now, like I said earlier, this one is currently overridden. Um, despite being normally open, all the contacts are connected together. I checked with a multimeter. So this relay is closed. It's in the override state. Suppose this was on a ship powering one of the big turrets. Um, power comes from the control room into the relay and keeps the coil energized. But in the middle of battle, something goes wrong. Uh, maybe the gun gets partially jammed, overheats the motors, triggers the overcurrent protections, or a torpedo impact knocks out the wiring going back to the control center. So the signal can't be sent to the coil to turn the relay on anymore. But the power coming in and the relay contacts are both still working fine. So your turret would function if only it had some juice and you need to return fire. So you send someone down to hit this plunger. That connects all the contacts together without requiring any power. It just latches that way. So the relay is taken out of the equation now. It stays closed, conducting uh, for the rest of the battle. And then when the fight's over, the crew comes down, they make repairs, they reconnect the wiring, then they send the signal again. And when it hits this thing, it closes the contacts, then reopens them, this pops up, and it goes back to normal operation. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I can't see how else it would. And if that's true, then this is literally for the Star Trek scenario. A ship is under fire, things are breaking down, and the chief engineer is on the shipwide intercom yelling for repair crews to quote unquote, bypass the starboard relays. And I don't mean to trivialize the horrors of real war by comparing them to my cute pop culture TV show, but if this is one of the things that Star Trek's writers actually drew from real life, then congratulations, nerds. We've all been rolling our eyes at a reflection of a genuinely terrifying reality all these years. The EPS relays trope has been mocked for decades, and it would be remarkable if it was actually one of the more realistic elements of the whole franchise. But uh, hey, this is uh, just for entertainment, right? I don't know how much of that was accurate, and I can't even be sure if this is how it actually works. Like I said, I don't wanna randomly apply voltage to these leads, um, and I'm not gonna open it up because I'm very concerned there could be toxic materials inside. I did have it open once briefly before I thought about that, and I couldn't make heads or tails of anything, it was all sealed up inside. So I can't really get to the truth of this thing, but I think I inferred correctly. I'm sure someone with experience will tell me in the comments whether I got it correct or violently wrong. That's really the only reason I made this video, just to talk about this thing I only barely understood, share it with you, etc., and maybe find out in the process if it works at all like I thought. Let's find out. And also to point out that we were all being dicks about the Star Trek thing. But there was one other reason. I wasn't sure about this, but you know when you have a horrible thought and you need someone else to hear it so you're not alone? Well, congratulations, you're in this with me now. When I learned what a battle short was, my brain began trying to map it to ideas I already understood, and I realized that we must not, under any circumstances, let the suits hear about this. Just, just, just think about it. Picture some soulless business droid in an elevator saying, yeah, our startup's running with the battle shorts in right now as a euphemism for something like uh, making everyone work 80 hour weeks and not paying overtime. You know, safety measures offline just until things settle down and we become profitable. I mean, it could also happen in uh, say software development as a euphemism for the much lauded move fast and break things approach. Yeah, we're in battle short mode right now. No error checking or anything. We'll add all that later. Also, we're working 80 hour weeks and not paying overtime. However you view the military, the prospect of some empty husk of a person looking at a thing that's meant to prevent people from being pulverized by bombs and applying the terminology to utterly trivial bullshit like code or stonks is just revolting, but also fully on brand. I know I'm inventing a guy here and getting mad at him, but I also know this will happen. It's only a matter of time. So if you ever hear your boss say this word, you'll know it's time to get up and walk out out of sheer self-preservation. You'll thank me later. All right, that's all I got. Um, if you enjoyed this mess of a video, cool. I'm glad to hear it. Maybe consider subscribing and uh, maybe turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new videos. If you particularly enjoyed it though, consider supporting me on Patreon. It cost me quite a bit to get most of the stuff I show off here, although not this, this was $4.
Uh, but a lot of the stuff costs more, and I do have to keep the lights on here in the studio, after all. Uh, and all the people to my right and your left are making that possible. I'm grateful to all of them, uh, and to you, if you decide to become one. So hit that link in the description if that sounds good. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's supporting me. I couldn't do this without you. And to everyone else, thanks for watching.